So this is the last week, our eighth and last week, our final part of the Read Your Bible series. Who's bummed? Because I am. All right? I'm bummed because I, wanna, I want us to keep reading our Bibles. You see what I did there? All right, anyways. So our entire series of this uh, thing that we do is to what? To read your Bible. All right. In your mind, raise your hand if you have been reading your Bible. I said, okay, I said in your mind. Now that's, <laughs> everybody's raising their hand, you know. <laughs> anyways, okay. You know, I've enjoyed this so, you know, so much just hearing from different speakers and from different angles. And uh, I have the privilege of closing today's uh, message and today's series, um, and it's going to be awesome. You know, let the youth guide close out the whole series of eight weeks, right? Anyways, first I want to remind everybody that, you know, if you don't have a Bible, if you don't have a Bible, on the breeze, in the breezeways, there are Bibles available for you. And here, here's a kicker. Here's a news flash for you. If you don't have a Bible, you know, there's an app called the Bible app that you can download, and it can be accessible to you on your phone right away, you know. And addi- in addition to that, our uh, very partner, Jim uh, DeSico, generously wrote this Roman study guide for us, all right? So if you want to, you know, have a copy of this or a PDF or, you know, if you want a hard copy of it, please let us know and then we will print that out for you, okay? But before we dig into the Word of God, let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for this time where we can close out the series or read your Bible. But God, let this not be it where we read our Bibles, but let this be a lifetime thing. Lord, and as we uh, dig into your word, Lord, let your glory be shown and let the believers be united in your glory. God, this is not me speaking, but this is you speaking. So Holy Spirit, fill this room and let your presence be here. Open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I hope that you know, everybody's been reading their Bible through SOAP. All right. So SOAP stands for what? Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Right? Scripture is literally just doing this. It's backwards. All right? It's doing this and opening your Bible to actually reading it. Okay? You don't need to, like, methodically say, you know, it's... August 5th today, so it's going to be 8th chapter of, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like, you just open your Bible. That's all you need to do, okay? Observation. The easiest way that I like to do observation is to answer these questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? I mean, that's of the Bible. That's so simple. It's like elementary English, right? And then application, with the application, is all about how does this passage apply into my own life? How does it apply into my own life? And then prayer. And, you know, most of us kind of get afraid when it comes to prayer because, you know, we think that we have to be like, oh, almighty gracious Father and Lord Jesus Christ, right? No, it doesn't have to be like that. There are times where we can revere who God is. But literally, prayer is a simple conversation with God. Like, hey, Dad, like, I read this passage today, and it's really stirring up in my heart. I don't understand it all, but help me to understand it. I love you. Thank you. Amen. Like, that's prayer. I don't think, like, I don't, it doesn't get any simpler than that. So if you don't know how to read your Bible, uh, you have no excuse because for the past eight weeks we've been going over soap, okay? So if you don't know this by now, then come talk to me. I'll say it to you one more time, okay? You know, but I think the core of I don't know how to read your Bible is an excuse of I don't want to read my Bible. The core of I don't know how to read my I don't know how to read my Bible is an excuse of saying I, I don't want to read my Bible. You know, while I'm on the subject, let me just poke a little bit more. Can I? Can I? Because even if you say no, I will, okay? Because I'm gonna poke. For those of us who say, um, I don't have time to read my Bible. Lies! All right, that's all lies. I, you have time to read your Bible. All right, it's 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 such a dumb excuse. I don't know, like, like how many times do you spend, you know, looking at through Facebook, okay, or Netflix, you know, trying to choose what movie to watch and end up watching The Office, right? Or, 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 you know, how many times do you sit on your toilet, 
You know what I mean? Like, you have time to read your Bible. There is no excuse to that whatsoever. You know, it's like that show Life PD. Anybody watch that show? All right. If anybody watch, it's a police show. It's a real live action show, right? And the police pull somebody over and they say, hey, license and registration. But then the police see something suspicious, like a smell of marijuana or a glassy eyed or something like that. And the police says, hey, knowing that they have drugs in the car, police goes, um, do you have any drugs in your car? And the answer is always, no, no, I don't. No, I don't have any drugs in my car, even though it reeks of marijuana or, you know, has, you're impaired, right? And the police goes, step out of the car, let me search your car because it's, it's the process that we have to do. Canine comes and finds four full bags of heroin, right? And then it's like the, the guy says, it's not mine. It's, it's not mine, but it wasn't my car, but it's not mine. Somebody must have put it there. Maybe somebody lost it. That lame excuse it's the same thing when we say we don't have time to read the Bible. It is. It really is. It's so lame. All right? So read your Bible. All right? I, I, don't, I think I harpooned that enough just, uh, you know, for today. Anyways, but see what the Holy Spirit does when you read your Bible. You may sit down to read it only for 10 minutes, but, man, he may open up the floodgates and for you to read for another hour or so. Because here's what the Bible says. Look at what Psalm 119, 103 says. How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Guys, this is the word of God. The word of God is sweeter than honey. Don't be that guy that says, those aren't my drugs, my car. Even though it's my car. All right, again, it's a lame excuse. So here we are. Last few chapters of Romans. Woo! All right, I don't know if you're not awake, you're awake by now. Okay, so let's do a recap of the whole book of Romans. If you don't have, if you have lunch plans, cancel it now. Okay, I'm just kidding, all right? Let's just do a quick recap. Okay, uh, some of you guys are like, what? Okay, Romans 1 through 8, okay, it's all about the foundation of good news. It's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is explaining the fundamentals and the foundation of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Okay, basically, again, it's the gospel of message. And one verse that sums up this whole chapters 1 through 8 is, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, we're sinful and we need a Savior. And that we are only justified through faith in Jesus Christ. And that through Jesus we have freedom and we have victory. In his name. And then in Romans 9 through 11, okay, it's all about the internal response to God. Internal. How we respond to that foundation of the good news. And Paul emphasizes the sovereignty of God over salvation and how one might come to have the right relationship with God. And the word verse to summarize all of these chapters is, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Next. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. See, good works and good vibes are not the way to have a right relationship with God. It's not how much you give, it's not how much you sacrifice that gives you the right relationship with God. Good works and good vibes and sacrifices and giving, those may all be the fruit of your of the right relationship with God, but it doesn't give you the right relationship with God. But only way to have the right relationship with God is by confessing and believing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of your life. And I want to stop right here and ponder upon those two words a little bit. Lord and Savior. You know, most of us here are really good at trusting Jesus as our Savior, but all of us are really horrible at trusting Jesus as a Lord. We want a Savior, but we don't want a Lord. See, we love the saving part because saving part frees us. Saving part is, well, if we're in the ditch, he saves us. Great, right? But when it comes to having Jesus rule over every aspect of our lives, man, we're horrible at it. It's like the parable of the rich young ruler. If you don't know this parable, go to Mark chapter 10, you know, and it's right there. You know, he desires salvation. He says, hey, good teacher, 
what can I do to earn the salvation? And Jesus says, hey, obey the commandments. And the young guy goes, I've done it all. Like, I've done it all. And then he throws in this right hook and says, then go sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. Now, did this young rich ruler go away happy and did that, or did he walk away sad? He walked away sad because he couldn't have Jesus as the Lord over he, he had money as a Lord over his life. Now, this parable isn't just talking about money or finances when it comes to it, but it's talking about the condition of our hearts, or about the uh, condition of our hearts in terms of having Jesus as our Lord and not just our Savior. See, Jesus indeed is our Savior, but Jesus is also Lord over every area of our lives, like our fears, our anxiety, our joys, our jobs, our finances, our families, our friends, our emotions, our ideologies, our time, and our political beliefs. Jesus has to be the ruler and the Lord over all those things. And that's what Paul is emphasizing here in um, chapters 9 through 11. Placing our faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross and making him Lord over our lives. And lastly, we have been going over in the past two weeks, chapters 12 through 13, uh, and today we're going to dig into chapters 14 through 16. But from 12 through 16, it's all about the external response to others. Right? We have the foundation of the gospel. We have the internal response to God. Right? And then we have the external response to others. To summarize these four, uh, five chapters, right, is this. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters... In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. These verses provide the basic instruction from Paul on how to live a holy lifestyle. Not conforming to the pattern of this world but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, when we have that renewed mind, the upward, right, the right relationship with God, the outward, me and the others, will look dramatically different because the upward is right. So basing, off our, basing our understanding of the foundation, knowing that we must renew our minds, let's take a look at Romans 14 through 16. These last three chapters are really about the unity of believers. The external, the outward, the unity of believers. It's about how we as believers need to come together for one purpose. And that one purpose is what we're going to unfold here today. And for those of you who like taking notes, um, it's break, broken off into two parts. Okay, first part is going to be setting aside differences. Setting aside differences. And second part is one heart and one mind. And if you don't get anything out of today's message, I want you to walk away with this, to be united believers, Jesus must be at the center of our lives. To be united believers, Jesus must be at the center of our lives. You know, all of us here could not be any more different from each other. For example, I was born in Korea. You weren't. Okay? Simple as that. <laughs> okay? Some of you love tenders over Chick-fil-A. Heathens, all of you, okay, whoever, whoever loves tenders over Chick-fil-A, okay, just kidding, I like tenders too, They're open on Sundays. Um, some of you are <laughs> die-hard Panthers fans, okay, yeah, who, I think that was Chris, was that Chris? No, I don't know who that was, okay, some of you are die-hard Panthers fans, and some of you just don't care about football at all, okay, how un-American of you, okay, some of you Love real sushi. Okay? California roll is not real sushi, people. <laughs> Understand that. Just trust the Asian when it comes to sushi. Okay? Some of you are hashtag lake life. But some of you are hashtag salt life. I'm more of a hashtag mountain life. I love the mountains. Okay? Everyone here represents different generations, different bloodlines, different personalities, different characteristics. Some of us here are different, have different timelines of knowing who Jesus is, right? And many of us are from different denominations, okay? I'm surprised we haven't killed each other yet. 
All right, and we will continue to not to kill each other. But this is exactly what Paul is talking about here in these three chapters. You see, the Roman church was a very diverse church. Paul knew that, you know, with diversity comes different ideas. It comes different personalities, different ideologies, different beliefs, different stage of faith in Jesus. And here's how we know that. Let's go to chapter 16. You know, we're going to work a little backwards here. But it's important that we work backwards to understand how diverse the Roman church was. This last chapter is uh, Paul's greeting to many different ministry partners in his, uh, in, his, in his ministry in the Roman church. So verses 1 through 16, Paul lists a bunch of names. Okay, we won't go over all these names, but I encourage you to go read it because, I mean, we are in the Read Your Bible series after all, right? So... Oh, and if you're expecting a child or trying to change the name of your child, this is a great place to start because these, it contains pretty awesome names, okay? Anyways, so from this list of names, we see this. We see Jewish names, okay? Priscilla, Achilla, and Jornikis, Junia, Herodian. Okay, we see Jewish names, okay? But we also see Greek names given to Gentiles such as Hermes. There is supposed to be an S right there, but it's okay. Hermes and Olympus. Okay, and not only that, we have uh, some people who are slaves still to, and, and currently in bondage of, under the Greek masters who are Gentiles. Like, and they, they carry the household names like Aristobulus or Narcissus. But women were also very prominent in the Roman church. It's kind of surprising. But 10 of 27 names, that's one-third, at least one-third, names that Paul mentions in this chapter is women. Okay, and Paul greets them, and there are Phoebe, Priscilla, Mary, Junia, Trifina, Trifosa, Perseus, Rufus's mother, just it says Rufus's mother, right? Julia and Nereus' sister. That's ten names for women. Not just attenders, not just attendees, not just people who sit in the church pews. No, these were partners, these were working and serving women of the church. You know, this is both awesome and radical because if you think about it, in both Judaism and in the Greco-Roman world, women were not a big part of anything or of any society, really. They were not, you know, looked upon as leaders or they're not looked upon as workers. So to Paul to have greet these women, I mean, this is radical. This is fantastic. So as you can see, diversity is up, down, left, right. I mean, we have Gentiles, we have Jews, we have slaves, we have women. Yeah, this is one intensely divided, uh, diverse body of believers. And it's just like all of us who we are gathered here today. You know, some of you are in your 20s. Some of you are in your 60s. Some of you are from the West Coast. Some of you from the East Coast. I'm more of a Midwesterner myself. All right? And some of you have a very thick southern twang, all right? And uh, it's awesome. Please teach me, all right? And uh, some of you sound like you might be part of an Italian mob just because by the way you talk, okay? Because, <laughs> you know, and some of you brought up in the church. Some of you weren't brought up in the church and found faith later in life. See, diversity isn't just a race thing. It's not, a, it's not just a race thing. Diversity is it's any detail that shows how different our individual lives are. So Paul, knowing about this diversity in the Roman church, he puts his foot down right off the bat in verse 1 of chapter 14 by saying this, Now accept one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment of opinions. He basically says, hey guys, stop judging each other. Why are you judging each other? He doesn't play around. He just says, why are you judging each other? And there are a couple of reasons why Paul is saying that right off the bat here. First, Paul ended his previous chapter by saying what? Love each other. Donnie talked about this. He taught the, he taught the Roman church by, that by loving each other, you're fulfilling the law. So stop judging each other and love each other. Second, the Roman church is divided over things that were based on. Deferring opinions. Wait, what? Are we sure that Paul is talking to the Roman church right now? 
Are we sure that he's talking to the Roman church? Because to me, it sounds like he's talking to the 21st century church and us body of believers, just saying. Now, Paul uses an interesting language here in uh, chapter 14 that makes our thoughts kind of go, huh? And throughout chapter 14, he unpacks the idea of weak in faith and strong in faith. Now, I'm going to ask you to put on a different thinking cap here because what you think weak is and what you think strong is is totally not what Paul is mentioning here. So, let's, so bear with me here and put on a different thinking cap. So weak in faith does not refer, refer to those who are, well, weak in faith or immature. But rather, it's those who lack clarity and are unsure of how they are supposed to use their freedom in Christ. There are those who lack in clarity and are unsure of how they're supposed to use their freedom in Christ. And the strong in faith doesn't refer that whose faith is strong or mature, but it's rather Paul is referring to those who have an accurate understanding of God and his kingdom and are able to actualize the Christian freedom without conflict in conscience. Without conflict in conscience. This has nothing, nothing whatsoever with the level of faith. This has nothing to do with the level of faith. And Romans 14 is broken up into two parts. In verses 1 through 12, Paul focuses on the weak. In verses 13 through 23, Paul focuses on the strong. So first, let's go over why Paul was addressing those who lack clarity and are unsure of how they're supposed to use their freedom in Christ. Look at verse 2 of chapter 14. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. You know, we can make the judgment here that those who are weak in faith were mainly from a Jewish background because of the issues that Paul is addressing here, like eating or not eating meat, drinking wine or not drinking wine, you know, observing the holy days always or not observing the holy days always, and whether to, you know, this, these were part of the Jewish culture. You know, they have been taught since birth that these things, these rituals, you know, and practices to avoid certain foods or, you know, drinks in order to maintain their religiosity, their standing before God. This is what they were taught. So in order to stand right before God, you have to do this, you have to do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. That was a Jewish culture. That was how they were brought up. So Paul, being a Pharisee at one point, was very aware of this situation. He understood it. And he understood that it was going to be very hard to break those habits, those rituals. So you can imagine, you know, being a follower of Jesus and and understanding the freedom, right? Now they are no longer bound by the law of what Moses, you know, what the Torah says, or, you know, and then knowing the freedom in Jesus, now they have this freedom to do whatever they, you know, what, what is good for their Christian faith. So Paul found nothing wrong with this, though. Paul never says, you are wrong because you're practicing these rituals and practices or not practicing them. But he allows the the Jewish Christians who want to express their faith through these traditions, he allowed them to do that. He didn't object to any of that. But what he did object to was this. The weak in faith, those who understood, uh, those who, you know, who were... uh, lacking clarity and unsure of how they were supposed to use the freedom in Christ of knowing who Jesus is, were criticizing other believers for not following their own traditions. That's what he was objecting to. Those who were drinking wine. They were criticizing those who were eating meat. You know, they were criticizing those who were missing out on the holy days. They're criticizing those who were using their freedom in Christ. See, Paul is going to beyond the issue of food here, beyond the issue of drinks here. He wasn't concerned about the food one was eating or not eating. He wasn't concerned about what holy days you were keeping or not keeping. See, Paul was more concerned about the trivial matter, such as these, causing a division among the church in the people in the Roman church. He was concerned about that. So after Paul rebukes the weak in faith, verses 1 through 12, he goes and rebukes the strong in faith, those who are using their freedom in Jesus without conflict in conscience, in verses 13 through 23. You know, he rebukes the strong for having a selfish attitude. 
That's what he rebukes here. In the way that they use their liberty in Christ and in turn becoming a stumbling block for other believers. That's what he's rebuking here. So he rebukes the strong. And the strongs are the ones who prided themselves into having insight and understanding that they have the freedom in Christ. Again, Paul had no problem with the strong. He had no problem with the strong using the liberty, just as he had no problem with the weak using their um, uh, practices and ordinances of their Jewish faith. But Paul had a problem with the way that they used their faith to look down on others and other believers. Again, again, are we sure that Paul is just talking to the Roman church right now? Are we sure? Because I feel like he's again speaking to us in the 21st century. No, issues not, might, might, not, might not be the same for us. You know, we could talk about drinking alcohol or getting tattoos, right? Or coming to church on Sundays, just to name a few. And here, is, here are three reasons why Paul was so adamant about being careful the way that we use and, and one exercises his own freedom and liberty without being a stumbling block. So here's the first reason. They weren't acting in love. They weren't acting in love. Look at verse 15. It says, For if your brother is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy that one Christ died for what by what you eat. Paul reminds the Roman Christians that in the previous chapter, that love is the paramount of Christian value and Christian virtue. See, it has to, love has to guide all of our behaviors, every aspect of our lives and all of our behaviors. He stresses that liberty is not as important as love. When we set our virtues in love, liberty takes a back seat. And Donnie, again, talked about this last week. Second reason was liberty is good, but when it's abused, it is no longer good. Liberty is good, but when it's abused, it is no longer good. If we bring harm to other believers while we're using our liberty, then it is no longer good. It's like, you know, if a believer struggles with alcoholism and that you bring a six-pack into their home because they invited you, you're doing more harm than good. There is liberty in what you can drink, yeah, but you're bringing harm to your other believer, your brother or sister in Christ. Liberty is good. You know, look at verse 16. I mean, this is what it's all about. Therefore, do not let your good be slandered. This is Paul talking. When it becomes a separation of the church by the, the excuse of your liberty, then it is no longer good. And lastly, um, the reason why Paul was so adamant and to be, be careful about the way that we exercise our liberty is because of the well-being of the church as a whole. Look at verse 19. So let, then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. There should be a paramount concern of the well-being of the church. Not just, you know, church or local church. I'm talking about the church. The pursuit of peace and building up of other body of believers rather than division. Paul wasn't just, again, concerned about the Roman church. He's concerned about today's church as well. He wasn't just writing to the Romans. I think he's writing to us as a body of Christ at large. So how, I mean, with those who practice traditions, with those who have liberty in Christ, how can we be unified in this matter? How can we unify in this matter? Because again, some of you are more from traditional background and probably cringe at some of the things that we, we do here at Journey. <laughs> All right? Some of you might be, you know, scoff at those people here who have more of a traditional background. You know, I come from a very conservative and traditional background, as in, uh, I think throughout my life from birth, no, before even being conceived, all the way to 18, I think I missed church like five times. And that was it. Yeah, that was how traditional I am. And then I went to college, a Christian college, and uh, saw that to others. Missing church was not a sin. And uh, that was very hard for me to accept. Because I'm like, you heathens, like, why are you missing church? You know, and then I became a rebel, and then, you know, what, that's what a whole different story. Okay, 
But with, you know, with every follower of Jesus in this room has have different rituals, right? Different ideologies, different theologies, doctrines and practices and political views and prayer lives and personal lives. So how, so how can we be unified as a body of believers with all these differences? I think this one verse unifies everything that Paul is talking about here. Let's look at verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of a living, a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but a living, a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If one chooses to not eat meat and they have a right relationship with God, they have the freedom and the liberty to do so. If one chooses to eat meat and they have a right relationship with God, they have the freedom and the liberty to do so. Both have the freedom to do so in their liberty and freedom and their own relationship with God. Your faith does not look the same as everybody else in this room. Your relationship with God, the way that you pray, does not look the same as everybody else in this room. The kingdom of God is not measured by what we eat and what we don't practice and what we wear. It's not measured by how many Sundays you miss or, or what legalistic things you do. It's not measured by that. Too many churches are divided over the color of the carpet. Come on. Like, what's up with that? What, what coffee to serve on Sunday mornings? I say just take the coffee away if you're going to have fights about it. You know? I know. I'm just saying. You know, I, how Sunday mornings should look. Too many churches are divided over such little things that are so unimportant in the eyes of God. So if we would just stop quarreling amongst each other about our differences, we would see that. It's a challenge, no doubt. It's a challenge, you know, because we want to be right. We want to be the correct ones. We want to be the stubborn ones that say, no, my way is the right way or it's the highway, right? I mean, that's, that's how we think. Setting our differences aside means first loving each other just as Christ commanded us to. But also because we're loving each other, it means that setting our focus on something bigger than us, that's something in the bigger picture, and that is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is the bigger picture that we need to focus on here, not on the little things that we fight over. The kingdom of God is about serving one Lord, one Jesus, one Savior, one God. The kingdom of God is living out the goodness and the peace and the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is. We're all striving for the same mission and the same cause. It's all about loving one another just as Jesus commanded us to. I'm going to keep repeating that because it's so true. That's our mission. It's about serving one master together. We're all slaves to Christ. We belong to Jesus. Despite the differences of our opinions, it's all about having one heart and one mind. So what does one heart and one mind look like? Because this is kind of hard to pull off. How, what is Paul talking about here when he says he's one heart and one mind look like? Or smart of Paul, he writes in this next chapter, after chapter 14, right? One thing I really, about, really love about Paul's teaching is this. He teaches, he teaches, he teaches, and then he goes into this little prayer called uh, wish prayers for the people that he's teaching to. Okay? So it's basically Paul talking to God and intervene, intervene uh, God to intervene in the lives of the people that he's teaching to and preaching to. So he just taught about setting aside the differences, right, of opinions and focusing on the kingdom of God. Then in the beginning of chapter 15, Paul is addressing to the believers to be strong, right? To be strong um, in the way that we treat our brothers and sisters. To be strong in the way that we carry each other's burdens. To be strong in the way that we love one another. Then Paul drops this prayer in chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth, you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is asking, for, uh, asking God for unity because he knows the setting aside of the differences will be a challenge. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. We're human. It's going to be hard. 
So what is he asking here? Is he asking that people to be clones of each other? Is he asking that we all be robotic, never disagreeing about anything? No, but I think Paul is asking God that people will be united in spirit and in attitude. The people will be united in spirit and in attitude. Not theology, not politics. Those are so temporary, right? And not rituals, but in spirit and in attitude. I like to think of it this way. You know, football season is almost upon us. Woohoo! All right? It's, got, it's awesome, all right? And I cannot contain the joy I have for my Chiefs, okay? I'm a Chiefs fan. I grew up in Kansas, all right? And I hope that they will win the Super Bowl someday, maybe this year, maybe next or before I die. I don't know, all right? Because we're, yeah. Anyways, I have hopes. Hope is good, right? So here's, so think about the NFL for a second. Okay, all the guys in here, some of you guys are like, yes, I will think about the NFL, Okay, and that's because that's all you're thinking about, all the trades happen, you know, and whatnot. So think about the NFL for a second. The NFL is a big umbrella, okay? NFL is a big umbrella, and under that umbrella are many different teams, aren't there? Right, there are many different teams. How many teams are there under the NFL? Okay, no, that, don't answer that question because I thought somebody would knew, uh, know, but nobody knows. So within each team, right, under that umbrella, within each team, playbooks are different, aren't they? Right? Coaches are different, aren't they? Facilities are different. Practices are different. But come game day, come game day, it doesn't matter what team you belong to, everyone has the same attitude and the same mindset, and that is to what? That is to win the game. That is to win the game. It doesn't matter how you've practiced it over the week. It doesn't matter who coached you over the week. On game day, you have the same mindset, same attitude, and that is to win the game. And that's what Paul is praying about here. You see, the NFL is like the body of Christ. NFL is like the body of Christ. And under that umbrella of the body of Christ, we have many believers, such as you and I. And see, each of us have a different method of praying and becoming more and more like Jesus. Or each of us, each of us have a different way of serving the community or becoming a part of the community. The way that we read our Bible is different. No doubt we will have the differences over inessential theology, right? Or the way that theology should be practiced and translated into practice. But here's the thing. On game day, it doesn't matter what method you have chosen to become more and more like Jesus. The same attitude and the same mindset is to glorify God. That we ought to have the same mindset. You see, game day for NFL is, when is it? Mondays, Thursdays, and Sundays. Did I, get that, did I get that correct? I think I did. But game day for us followers of Jesus is an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing. Paul isn't saying that there needs to be an absolute uniformity of thinking here. He isn't saying that. We don't need to be clones of each other. We don't. That would be so boring. And if we were to be clones of each other, be like me, Okay. So that would be so boring. I'm just saying. Like, we don't need to be close to each other. Rather, having unity in spirit and in attitude refers to an underlying sense of belonging to each other and loving each other. That brings glory to God. God is honored when we are striving, when we are all striving for the same goal. God is honored when Jesus' followers are unified in spirit instead of division. The kingdom of God is expanded when we are unified with one heart and one mouth, worshiping and serving the same Jesus. Remember this bottom line? To be united believers, Jesus must be at the center of our lives. Unity can only happen when we put aside differences and have Jesus as our driving force in our lives. Our differences of opinion should not be the factor that divide us. You know, we already have a nation that is so divided. And so if we as believers chime in on that division and play along with it, who are we glorifying? Nobody. We're glorifying nobody. Actually, we're playing right into the hands of the devil who only kills and destroys and steals. That's what we're doing. Jesus' followers are called to be in this world, not of it. This is a temporary world for us. We're here today and we are gone tomorrow, guys. 
We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. So what are we doing quarreling about such insignificant and pointless things compared to what eternity is like? So we as believers, we're all on the same team. We operate on the same authority of Jesus. That's how we operate. We serve the same Jesus who was and is and is to come. So while we're in this world, we ought to be of one heart and one mind. Can you imagine in this divided nation? Just imagine with me because I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Can you imagine in this divided nation with racism and, and political views, if all of us believers came together with one unified mindset to show who Jesus is? Imagine that. Imagine how many people would see and believe the truth of who Jesus is as the absolute hope through his church as a unified organism. And when we operate as a unified organism, here's what happens. Every knee will bow. Fear will bow. Racism, anxiety, depression, mental illness, divorce, death, addiction, sickness will bow before the name of Jesus because they see the unified mind and heart of the believers. I get goosebumps just thinking over it because what Jesus has to offer is so much greater than what the world has to offer. But here's the thing. It can't happen without starting with you and I. It starts with you and I. Every single person in this room, it starts with us. It all goes back to Romans chapter 12, 1 through 2. It starts with renewing of our minds, getting rid of our old ways, and allowing the Holy Spirit to rebuild the ways that we think. And rebuilding does not happen without a blueprint, and our blueprint is the Word of God. Our blueprint is the Word of God. And, and if we don't have the blueprint, you know, if we're all looking at different blueprints, then how can we be united as believers? There is no way. There's no way that we can be united as believers if we're all looking at different blueprints. We ought to be looking at one blueprint that God has given us. That's why we do series like Read Your Bible. It's not homework. Re reading your Bible should not be a chore. It's not homework. It's not an assignment. Reading your Bible is an everyday life. You eat every day. You breathe every day. Just as our physical bodies need food, our soul, our spiritual bodies need food as well. And if we're not reading the Bible, we are starving and making it hangry. All right? We're making it hangry. We need to feed our spiritual bodies. If you don't do it, you're starving again, the very thing that is keeping you alive and meant to give you life. So I'm going to put a question up on the screen here, and I want you to be really honest with yourselves. You know, don't just sit there and, and uh, stare at the screen, but I want you to challenge yourself with this question. And the question is, what's keeping you from reading your Bible? So what's keeping you from reading your Bible? Because if we're to be honest with ourselves, man, the excuses pile up. But again, those are just some human excuses and we shouldn't be using them. So I challenge you, read your Bible because it's the blueprint of our lives. It's the way that the Holy Spirit will start rebuilding the way that we think and renewing our minds. You know, it has been a fantastic series but don't let this be it reading our bibles continue on let's pray together father we desire to be unified believers god we want to make a difference in our communities god but it doesn't happen with all of us thinking in different ways and and not not thinking in the way that you've given us, God. So God, help us to read this blueprint that you have given us to be one-minded and one attitude and in one heart. 
that when people see the body, us body of believers, they would see Jesus. Not just people coming together to worship you, but they would see the love of you. So God, let us put down our lame excuses of not reading our blueprint that you have for us, your love letter for us. But let us pick it up and be renewed in our mind and be transformed. God, we love you. We love you so much. And let us be unified believers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.